there goes record yes so what we're gonna do today okay for this this week as such is we are going to talk about enzymes okay so just just like i said right now okay i need to drink chai because it, it kind of makes everything feel better so you you could think of you know this as my mood and this as chai and they just sort of come and fit together and then it makes everything like really better okay like like a hard thing that's exactly how your enzymes are going to work so um enzymes are these uh, you could say chemical substances okay and what these chemical substances are capable of doing is they are capable of enhancing anything that is already present like for example you have a mood okay like like let's say you have a what is what is the new term that you kids call vibe okay let's say you have a vibe and you just need some substance to kind of make it better so like like let's say you're vibing with particular music and then your favorite song comes along and you're like oh my god this is all i needed that's what your enzymes do to all the biological reactions that you have in your body okay so you're going to have let's say a reaction where you have just consumed some favorite food that you like and now that food is going in your body but an enzyme by the name salivary amylase comes into picture and makes the process of taking that food and breaking it down into smaller pieces much more faster than it would ever be okay if you were just um, let's say just just doing whatever normally you would do Okay, so that is that is something that you want to see. That is something that you want to understand about your um, enzymes. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start sharing my screen, and we are going to look into some actual biological definitions. Okay, so let's go here. Let's say share screen. As soon as you start seeing my screen, just let me know so that I could go ahead with whatever it is. I can I can see your screen. All right. So now what we want to talk about is your enzymes. Okay. So like I said, enzymes are going to be the catalysts. Okay. And what these catalysts are going to do is they're going to enhance your um, any kind of reaction that you may have in your body. Another thing that uh, we could recall from the previous sessions that we have done, okay, we spoke about something called as protein. Oh, why did that happen? Just give me a second. Okay, so we spoke about something called as the proteins, right? I hope you remember the proteins part. So we said that your proteins are going to have various shapes. Okay, so there, there was going to be just a single uh, you know, single shaped protein, you could say they just are present in one plane. So that was going to be your 2D shaped protein. Then you had your proteins that were in uh, associations like this, making plates. So there was alpha plate and beta plate, right? So those, those were the kind of proteins that we spoke about. Then we spoke about your 3D proteins. And then the fourth protein that we spoke about or the fourth category of proteins that we spoke about was your globular protein. Your enzymes are a example of globular protein. Okay, so that means that whenever you look at your enzymes, what you're going to see is a 3D structure like this. So let's say this is the structure you have. Okay, so your globular proteins, or let's say just your enzymes, are going to be like this. Okay, they're going to be 3D in their appearance and they are also going to have very discrete shapes and geometries that are going to be very very specifically fitting up with another biological molecule that you have into you okay now these biological molecules that your enzymes go and attach to or fit with like like your jigsaw puzzles okay so i would say i have something that looks like this okay it seems like these two pieces were made for each other, right? These, these just kind of come together and they fit with each other. So if I was to separate them out, what I would see is I would have to make a break here this way and it would come out and I bring it back together and then it would just like magic fit back together. This is how your jigsaw puzzles work. Okay, exactly like this, you have enzyme 
which is going to have a very, very solid counterpart for it. And what happens with this particular substance is that it is the exact fit, fit of this particular enzyme. Okay, so you could you could think of these two substances like um, a perfect couple, okay, like, like made for each other, made in heaven kind of jewelry. So you have an enzyme and the second thing you're gonna have is the substrate. So substrate is nothing but the exact fit of your enzyme. And now what happens is, okay, this substrate was just sitting over here, minding its own business, not doing anything extraordinary. Okay, it was just present and doing whatever it was supposed to do. And then suddenly this enzyme comes into picture and just like that, you know, there's going to be guitars and violins and pianos all around and your substrate it's just going to start functioning so very well. In fact, uh, you could also say that before your enzyme came into picture, your substrate was living like a very sad life. Okay, you could say before I met enzyme, I was very sad and I there was nothing good happening in my life. And then enzyme walked in and then your entire substrate life just kind of gets whooshed nice and happy. Okay, so that is, that is something that your enzymes do for your substrate, we also say that enzymes activate your substrates. Okay, so we're gonna write over here, what do they do? They activate your substrates, right? Which means that whatever function your substrates were already carrying out, your enzymes just go around and make that function 10 times better. Okay, they, they kind of enhance your enzymes to like the most precision level that they could ever get to. Okay, so imagine like like you having this class right now and there are, there are ideas that I have in my head right now. Like, <clears throat> you know, I wanted this enzyme to kind of have like those cartoony eyes and they, they just kind of go shine and be like, ooh, and the music. That's an idea I had in my head and then I couldn't execute it. But imagine if I had like a magic thing and I would be like, oh, this is something I want and it would just appear onto the screen. How amazing that would be. That's exactly what enzymes would make happen for your substrates, okay? Now, while, while all of this sounds really fancy and it makes a lot of sense that, okay, there is just this particular um, molecule out there that is going to make your substrate the happiest substance there ever was there is a catch to this particular thing okay which is that every enzyme is super specific which means that let's say if this is the substrate that you're talking about okay so i'm just gonna take this guy and i don't know i think my pencil just died on me okay so let's say i'm taking this guy okay this is my substrate and this is how my enzymes remembers my substrate being if this substrate was even manipulated a little bit, so let's say instead of it being like that, if it becomes a little smaller and changes its, you know, like shape just a tiny bit, not even a lot, just a tiny bit, your enzyme would just come here and it would be like, oh, there's no substrate here. And the substrate is like, whoa, bro, it's it's me. I just, I just got like a small makeover and enzyme's like, no, no not you. I cannot, I cannot do this. And they just leave. Okay. So your enzymes are super specific. They only make a complex. Okay. So this kind of arrangement that they enter into is called as a complex. It is called as enzyme, um, enzyme and substrate complex. Okay. ESC. This is very, very specific. In fact, it is so specific that it has its own terminology. Okay, so I'm just going to take this over here and put the color to it. And the terminology that we use to refer to the specificity is called as lock and key model. Okay, which means that this enzyme that I have here, hypothetically in my hand and the substrate that I have in another hand, they're just going to sit together with each other to make a complex, which is so very specific that it's almost like there's a lock and the enzyme is the perfect key to activate that particular lock. Okay, so that is, that is something that you are going to have. We can say this in another words that your enzymes and your substrates are going to complement each other very, very precisely 
so that they can um, function very very well okay and this complement that we are talking about is not just in the sense of their shapes but it's also in the sense of their chemical properties okay so these these are not only going to complement each other uh, on the basis of their shape but they're also going to complement each other on the basis of their chemical properties and the part okay the site where your uh, enzyme is going to come and attach to your uh, substrate okay that that particular spot it is going to be called as the active site okay so i'm going to take you to a different app and i'm going to show you exactly what i'm talking about and it's it's definitely going to make much more sense okay so here we go and all right so we have this screen for us okay let's say this is your enzyme so we're going to name this guy e okay and all right now this e is gonna have his own little friend like this okay this is the substrate now the enzyme is going to go in look or in search okay not in look that is the wrong term so this this enzyme is basically going to go in search of your uh, substrate okay and what it's going to do is it's going to find that particular substrate by a phenomena where we can we can uh, kind of think of this like your capacitation okay uh, capacitation is is sort of like when you have your uh, sperms okay the sperms that are the male gametes okay uh, whenever they are released out of the male's body okay and when they enter the female reproductive tract they don't have eyes to see things right so what what they do is they follow a chemical pathway that is shared by your egg okay so egg kind of sort of releases certain enzymes and certain hormones and your sperms can kind of walk onto that row where the smell has come from or the uh, you know hormones have come from and then they just kind of make their way towards your egg that is called as capacitation it's almost like there's a guiding map that your eggs provide all the sperms with so that they can make their way to them. Okay, similar to that, your enzymes and substrates also seem to have some kind of uh, communication mechanism, okay, where every substrate and every uh, enzyme knows how to find each other. Obviously, when we go into detail of this topic, you would learn that this pathway or this kind of attention where, you know, one cell is going to um, get into touch with another cell is nothing but your cell signaling, which we are going to talk about. But for right now, understand that these two cells are able to sort of um, attract each other, okay, chemically attract each other. And then what happens is these two will make their way toward each other, okay, just like this, and then snap, okay, just like this. It fits with the molecule this way. And you have the process of activation that takes place. Okay, now I'm going to make this here. And now what you see, okay, this is nothing but activation. Okay, that was not a very good execution of what I wanted, but you get me. Okay, so this is, this is where you are going to have the activation of your enzyme and substrate. The spot where this activation took place is your active site. And as soon as this particular kind of attachment is formed, okay, now this is the key point over here, they have come and attached to each other. And now to the horror of your substrate, okay, so this was just substrate being so happy. It was like, yay, I found the perfect match for myself, okay. And then to the horror of this particular enzyme, to the horror of this particular substrate, your enzyme just breaks this substrate into two parts. It's 
like that. Okay, and this process where your enzyme just sort of breaks your uh, substrate into two parts is called as catalysis. Okay, through the process of catalysis, what is happening? Your enzyme is going ahead and breaking your substrate into two parts. And then these two parts that have been recently formed. Okay, so I'm just going to make it here. Let's give it different colors. Oops. Completely forgot. This is not joint. Okay, and these two substances that have now been formed are called as nothing but the products. Okay, so this is going to be your product one and this is going to be your product two. All right, is this making sense? Are you, are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Yes. Yes, all right. So let's, let's see what happened. Okay, let's see this in a little lower speed. So there you have your enzyme and substrate coming, snap, attaching with each other, catalysis takes place and your substrate gets broken down into two products. This is what happens when you have your enzyme and substrate binding with each other. Okay. Now you would say this seems like a straightforward thing. There's a there's an enzyme and there's a substrate and they kind of come together and they seem to make two products. It's simple enough. But um, it is not always that straightforward in our bodies, okay? The things are not as easy as they appear to be. Sometimes what happens is there are certain other molecules in your body who um, also want to have a kind of very good, uh, you can say bonding with your substrate. Okay, so let's say there's this substrate all over again here and the enzyme in picture that we were talking about is not the one that is present here. Okay, instead what you have now is a different enzyme. Okay, now can you see that this is a different enzyme apart from what you had initially? What happens here, okay, is that this new enzyme that you have kind of wants to make bond with your uh, substrate, but um, it doesn't seem to be able to do that because obviously it's not the exact molecule that your substrate would prefer to bind with. Okay, so it's, it's maybe like um, you wanted to see Despicable Me movie and you told your parents, you know, you wanted to see this movie and they were like, yeah, cool, done. And they couldn't find the tickets to that movie. So they take you to see some movie directed by, you know, not, not the director you wanted to see, not, not Despicable Me, some other Despicable movie. It's not what you wanted, but then you're like, okay, you know what? Well, I'm gonna adjust here, okay? I'm, I'm gonna be the better person and I'm gonna adjust. So that's exactly what happens here. So you have this substance, which is not the exact enzyme that you wanted, but the substrate is like, okay, I'm gonna make the best of what I have. And therefore they're gonna come together Okay, not the exact fit, but they make it work. Okay, so we will take this and this way. Now, obviously you can see there are certain overlaps, but they work with that. So there's an overlap here, there's an overlap here. And this kind of fit, okay, which is definitely not your preferred fit but it still seems to do the thing okay so this is called as your induced fit this again is still going to end up so i'm going to copy this i'm going to put it here for you okay this obviously is still going to end up making two molecules which could be your substrate cup product one and product two may not be always the same uh, manner, okay? They might not break down in the same manner, but they would still be two products 
They could also be the same products. It's just that your substrate did not get broken down by the same enzyme that you wanted. Let me give you a live uh, example, okay, or, or like something that you would relate with. The enzyme here in the picture, okay, the first enzyme that we're speaking about is your insulin, right? So this is your insulin. And obviously the substrate thereby is any product that can be made into glucose, okay? Or, or something that is going to increase the glucose concentration in your body. How is it gonna do that? when it attaches to your substrate and breaks it down into glucose giving molecules, right? So this is your enzyme. And because of some uh, weird reason, your body just does not make insulin. So what you do is you kind of inject yourself with synthetic insulin. It's obviously not the insulin you wanted, but it's an insulin that you gotta work with. So we're gonna call this, okay, right now, for the reasons of understanding, I'm gonna call this fake insulin. You could also think like, you know, you this is an insulin disguised with some beard and some, um, you know, like spectacles. And then you're like, oh, okay, I can still make out your insulin. It was just not the insulin I wanted. And so it kind of does the work but is not the most appropriate fit. This kind of fit that your enzymes and substrate make is called as induced fit. Now, obviously when this is happening inside the body, your substrate is not as adjusting as we were in this example. So what your substrate says is, see buddy, what happened is you're not the perfect guy I wanted. So I'm gonna change you a little bit. So the enzyme, either makes the substrate attach itself and change the substrate's uh, binding site so that it fits perfectly with the substrate or the enzyme himself, okay? Now we're referring to enzyme as a male over here. So the enzyme himself will adjust its uh, active site, its binding site in such a manner that the enzyme, that the substrate feels much more comfortable binding with it. Okay, so this is the mechanism that is kind of going to go inside, making your uh, induced fit work in the most appropriate manner that it can. Okay, I am I am I making sense here? Is is this something that you are able to follow with me? Yes. Yes, you are. All right. So if if it doesn't, just just let me know. I can go over this part a few more times, but we have to learn this. Okay, I'm gonna be sharing this particular um, video with you, which is which is like the um, animation that we just created. Okay, you would have it for you. And whenever you want to go over, you could just look at the video back and you could um, obviously come back and look at it. Okay, now it did not seem to be affected by the shape of the substrate. Obviously your enzyme did not even seem bothered by the fact that there was a completely different uh, enzyme coming and attaching with it. Substrate was quite cool with it. It was like, okay, we got to change the shape. We got to change the shape. You would assume that there may not be many factors that could then affect this particular enzyme and substrate complex or, or just, just this enzyme. But that is not true, okay? Your enzyme, in fact, happens to be very, very uh, tender guy, okay? It, it's like a slight change in a particular uh, factor that it depends on could basically crumple him down, okay? So imagine, imagine like a very strong uh, superhero, but having like really stupid weaknesses. Like uh, if, you, if you've seen the movie uh, where there's Dwayne Johnson, I, I don't really remember the name, of the movie, but he's, he's like a superhero and he has another friend, okay, Kevin Hart, and this, this guy seems to have weakness, which is cake, just, just something like that. So your enzymes sort of seem to have these really weird weaknesses, okay? So if I'm going to write my enzyme as the superhero here, okay, your superhero enzyme kind of depends on the uh, availability of very good atmosphere. Okay, like, like atmosphere makes a lot of 
difference to this particular enzyme. So he needs like the room to be uh, perfectly chill. Okay, he wants the room to be like at the proper temperature. Like if it's too hot, he's gonna be like, I'm not doing superhero things to do. Or, or if the room is too cool, it's like, oh, I'm not doing superhero things either because it's it's like way cooler for me or it's way harder for me. Okay, so that, that is something that your um, enzymes are really bothered by, which is the temperature. Okay, now if you remember what we discussed for temperatures about your uh, proteins, we use the word that they are labile. Similar to your proteins, your enzymes are also heat labile. And the reason for this lies in the first statement that we made about your enzymes. We said that your enzymes are globular proteins. And since they are nothing, but globular proteins and globular proteins or any kind of protein is affected by temperature, your enzymes also indeed are affected by temperature. If you increase the temperature to an optimum level, okay, so like they can adjust between certain, um, you can say, thresholds of temperatures, okay? So like, let's say from the temperature of 22 to 27, they're like, totally fine, just like humans are, okay, like totally fine. It's not too cool, it's not too hot, just bearable. During that point, okay, starting from 22, if you keep on increasing the temperature all the way to 27, you would notice that the kinetic energy of the molecules of your enzyme also increase. And because the kinetic energy increases, the kind of are able to be very, very productive. But you go under this and they're dead. And you go over this and they're dead. So this zone, okay, like, like you could say the sweet spot of 22 to 27 is actually called as the optimum temperature. And if you keep the enzyme within this optimum temperature is just gonna be fine but increase the temperature a little bit or decrease the temperature a little bit and you have mess on your hands okay so that is that is something that you are going to um, understand when we learn this part another thing that seems to affect your enzymes like really really bad manner okay is your ph so pH is nothing but the potential of hydrogen. Okay? So you have pH, which is basically something that makes a substance either uh, acidic or basic. And your enzyme activity is going to be the highest. Okay, It is going to work smoothest when it is at the optimum pH or when it is between that optimum pH range. Okay, but should you increase the pH or lower the pH, these guys are not gonna uh, function. Again, why are they not gonna function? Because they are gonna get denatured. I'm gonna write denatured here. And because your enzymes are going to get denatured, they're not going to be functioning. But um, there is another catch to this entire theory that we just spoke. Okay, so let's say I have this enzyme here and I increase the temperature. Now, like I said, as soon as you increase the temperature, your enzyme is going to get denatured. So here you go you have an enzyme on your hand that has been broken down. So you have enzyme part one, and this is your enzyme part two. Now this enzyme one part and enzyme part two are gonna stay apart as long as the temperature is high. And as soon as the temperature reverts back to normal positions, your enzyme is just gonna be like, oh, look, no more higher temperatures. Let's get back together. Okay, so they don't seem to be bothered by uh, smaller things like separation, like like your Taylor Swift is like, you know, who just goes on singing, like we're never getting back together. Your enzymes are not that, um, you could say, you know, high demanding. They're like, it's okay. We don't have the higher temperatures no more. We can get back together and forever and ever. And they stay there till 
temperature seem to peak again. If your pH also seems to remain constant for a particular period of time, again, they undergo separation. And as soon as pH reverts back to normal, they're like, oh, we're getting back together. So, you know, you never really lose the enzymes in your body. First, you would never lose them because they are not participating in the reaction. They're just a catalyst. So they just go into the reaction, speed up the reaction, and then they come back. So you were not losing their concentration there. You were not losing their concentration even if they were getting deviated because they could just be put back together. Even if you increase the pH, they were just going to split. And then they were like, oh, look, we're getting back together. But something that would affect their uh, functioning for a longer period of time would be the concentration of your substrate. So I'm going to write concentration of the substrate. Now you might ask, how is it that the concentration of the substrate is going to affect? So if I had a graph to show you this, so let me take a graph paper. Here we have our graph paper, okay? So now let's say this is one and this is two. And I'm gonna make another one, but somewhere else, okay, not right away. So now if I say, I have on my hand, okay, a certain amount of substrate and I have certain amount of enzyme, okay? As in when the concentration of the enzyme would go on increasing, okay? So as in when the concentration of the enzyme would go on increasing, the concentration of the substrate has to go on decreasing. If the enzyme is increasing in amount and the substrate is decreasing in amount, there will be a point where the reaction rate would be zero. Okay, it would go on moving toward your zero because there is less and less substrate remaining to bind with your um, enzyme. And in that case, your amount of enzyme would go on increasing, but the amount of your uh, substrate would go on decreasing down. Okay, if you were to add more amount of substrate than there is the amount of enzyme, again, because there would be so many molecules of substrate to bind with and so little enzyme, the rate would again slow down. Okay, so you do want a optimum amount of um, substrate, it's okay if you have a little more amount of your uh, substrate because then it is going to be like there are going to be more collisions. More collisions mean that there are going to be more binding and more binding basically means that you are going to have a higher rate of reaction. But if, if you have so many molecules after a point of time, your uh, enzyme and substrate is going to reach a point of saturation and um, you're not going to have those kind of effects the way you uh, expected. Okay, so this is this is something that you are going to understand just as an overview. Now tell me, till this part that we discussed, is there anything that seems way uh, difficult or seems like, okay, maybe, maybe we should go over this point one more time. Anything like that? Just the last graph part of it. The graph. Okay, this this I, I was just explaining it to you verbally. I'll I'll make it into an easier point. Okay, let's let's do it this way. One and two. Okay. I have a certain amount of enzymes here with me, and I have a certain amount of substrates here with me. Okay. If I have more enzyme then i have substrate okay what is going to happen for every substrate i'm going to have one enzyme coming and binding so let's make that so one one two two three three four four five five six six it gets a little boring i know seven eight eight nine nine ten now, do you see, I have three more enzymes on my hand and I have no substrate. 
the rate of reaction for these kind of enzymes is going to be zero. They don't have anything to bind with. So there is no reaction taking place anymore. Or imagine another point where I do have a lot of substrate, but unfortunately, I don't have the enzyme to bind it with. Again, I have issue on my hand because now what I do have with me is a lot of substrate, but no enzyme to break it down. Again, my rate of reaction is going to go down. It does help if I have a little more enzyme on my hand than I have the substrate because that way my enzyme is going to have more collisions. More collisions is going to result in more uh, opportunities to bind with the substrate, but you don't want the uh, concentration of your enzymes to be really high. Okay, you want it like higher by maybe two or three molecules. If you're going to have anything more than that, then you're going to have a stagnancy in the rate of reaction because now you have a lot of enzyme and the enzyme has nowhere to be. Okay, is that making sense? Are you, are you following this part? Yes. Yes? Okay, so now this was this was just sort of like an overview of what your enzymes are able to do. Okay, if you go through the syllabus and if you see what exactly you're supposed to learn, you would understand that there is something called as an inhibitor molecule. Okay, now if you imagine your uh, enzyme to be like Raj and your substrate to be like Simran, well, the love story needs a good villain, okay? And in the love story of your enzyme and your substrate, the villain is nobody but a inhibitor molecule, okay? And all that this molecule does essentially, it stops them from binding. And you would ask why? And everyone has been asking why, even I am. But the molecule just does that. Okay? It just says, e, hmm, there are enzymes and substrates binding shame if someone was to stop it and then it goes and stops it from happening how would it do that so there is an enzyme here and there is a substrate and they were so happily bound to each other couldn't see that happening okay so it just takes these two guys together and there you go now what you have in the middle of these two guys is an inhibitor molecule like that and what this inhibitor molecule is doing is it is stopping your, oh, she shouldn't be happy. Okay, it is stopping your enzyme and substrate from meeting with each other. They can't even reach over to each other because this molecule is like too big to allow any amount of your substrate to even touch your enzyme, okay? The mechanism in which it does this is it either pairs with your enzyme and completely occupies the binding site of the enzyme, or it pairs up with your substrate and completely occupies the activation site of the substrate. There you go. Now your enzymes and substrates are not able to meet. And then the lock and key mechanism never takes place. And because the lock and key mechanism never took place, um, there is no catalysis, no catalysis, no products. And no products, that means this entire thing was in vain. So you, there was somebody, okay, just imagine, there was somebody who went through a certain amount of studies and they were like, oh, look, enzymes and substrates can bind with each other. And then someone came around and learned that you could just stop this from happening. So their entire study was based on the fact that, why is this happening? Why isn't there someone to stop it? And then they found out about your inhibitor molecules. And well, you could stop this reaction from taking place. Now you might ask, what is the purpose of me learning this in my syllabus? So this could be a very good point for us to understand that if there is an individual who has an hyperactivity of their pancreas, and let's say their body makes excess amount of insulin, than they need okay like for example there is glucose in their body obviously there's glucose in you right now i am consuming glucose right now and i obviously have excess amount of glucose i mean you could see this right so i do have a lot of glucose with me but um i don't want it to be broken down just in a day or two that'd be sad i mean it took me about what three months to get all of this 
thing and then i would lose it within a day or two it's it's really sad okay so what what i would want to do is i would want to break all of this glucose down into energy over a period of time okay i want it to break down i am not saying that i want to accumulate all of that i do want it to break down but i want the reaction of breakdown to be a linear path okay i want it to be an uprising uh, graph but i want it to be linear i don't want it to be very sudden i don't want the slope to be really steep i want it to go at a pace which my body can handle okay and for that i would want the amount of insulin to be maintained so having an enzyme or a molecule which would uh, stop all of the insulin from working all of a sudden would be like a boon to me right so i would have this extra insulin in me but there is a molecule that is kind of bottling all of it up works like a cork for your enzymes and then says that look there is ample amount of insulin in this body right now let's let's go a little slower let's break it down you know at a pace and let's let's not do all of this all of a sudden okay so that is that is somewhere your inhibitor molecules are going to play a very important role another thing is you would also understand that whenever you talk about your enzymes and whenever you talk about all of this reaction taking place okay, there was a guy uh, by the name of um, not not a single guy actually there was um, a couple okay and what what these two did is they were so moved by this concept of your enzymes coming and uh, attaching to the substrate and then um, you know just just having all of it function so well they were like this is all happening in biology and how can biologist just have so much fun let's let's make this a little difficult why don't we do a calculation and just induce some amount of math into this fun concept i'm pretty sure that's exactly what these two people were thinking and therefore you have your michaelis and menten coming into picture and they were like biology was so interesting we just got to add little bit of math to that and that is literally what they did and they gave you a concept which is called as your uh, michaelis and menten equation which basically tells you how fast or how slow the uh, binding sites of substrate have been occupied okay that is that is literally what you understand now i'm going to draw a very simple graph for you and then we are going to discuss that just a little bit okay so i'm going to take this here this is what i have let's take our scale let's put this down and this is it okay now look at what i'm going to write this is going to be my reaction path we are going to talk about your michaelis and menten equation as well before i take you there i just need you to understand this very very tiny process okay now here you have your reaction here you have your energy okay now understand i have the red is going to be for my reactants okay my reactants are at a particular concentration and because they are not doing anything because there is nothing happening there are no enzymes anything they are just being here as soon as okay i start to see some activity the point where i am going to see some activity is where the activation has taken place so we are going to say this is where activation of your enzyme has started it is going to go up it is going to move and then it's going to stop because that was the activation energy you gave it just went boom and then released down again okay now if i was to have my reaction okay take place but this reaction was to take place without any um catalyst here okay so let's say this is how my reaction was actually going when it did not have any catalyst now let's say i have this reaction taking place but what i have now 
is a catalyst with me. Now I need you to look at it very, very carefully. Okay. So it's coming here. It is getting activated and then it is going down. Okay. Let me just make this a little more precise. This makes more sense. What can you tell me about the amount of activation energy that is going here? So this is for your red. So I'm going to put this somewhere here, this way. Okay, and till here. And this is for my green. So it's going to go from here to here. Yes. What what is it that you observe as a difference here? Anything anything seems different. This line is the activation energy. The amount of energy. Okay. So, if you talk about the amount of energy that is required to do this with a catalyst, the amount of energy required to do a particular function is definitely lesser than what you would require if the catalyst was not present. This is how your enzymes are going to work. Okay, This was the first observation that anyone who studies enzymes would make. Okay, Then we understand that there is going to be a factor which just loves to stop this from taking place, which means that there is going to be a certain kind of inhibition. Now, there are two types of inhibitions. Okay, the right, we, we just heard that there is going to be a molecule which is going to sort of um, stop your enzyme and substrate from making that pair. Okay, so in this case, what example we saw was Simran's Babuji. Okay, he was like, just no, this cannot happen. Like, I don't approve of this. So there is there is like a competitive inhibitor. I uh, guess so Simran's father went through all the Falana Dimkana to stop Raj and Simran from meeting. I am I'm really sorry if I have the wrong reference of the movie. I have literally never seen the movie. I just heard someone tell it to me. So I'm, I'm just going to stick with that. So I hope this is the right story. But Simran and Raj want to get married to each other. But Simran's father does not approve. And so whatever Raj does, Simran's father does exact opposite of that to make sure that this union does not exist, okay? This is competitive inhibitor. He is competing with Raj so that the meeting of Raj and Simran does not take place. Competitive inhibitor, okay? And then there is something called as non-competitive inhibitor. So a non-competitive inhibitor Babuji would not let Simran meet Raj in the first place. You see how, how logically good that was? Like you don't have to compete if you never let them meet. Non-competitive inhibitor. It does not compete with the substrate at all. It says, I have absolutely no interest in doing all of this. It either will go and bind to your enzyme and be like, I have bound to this enzyme now. I'm not even competing. It will go bind to your enzyme and completely change the enzyme forever. Because the enzyme has been completely changed, your enzyme no longer even wants to go and meet the substrate. And because Raj and Simran don't even have any interest in each other, well, you are inhibiting something, but it definitely isn't by competition. Make sense, right? You follow with that? So there are going yeah. to be two types of inhibitions. One is a competitive inhibition and another one is a non-competitive inhibition. Now let's see what happens when you have a competitive inhibitor and a non-competitive inhibitor taking part in your reaction. What happens to the concentration of your substrate? So we got to need one more graph. So here goes the graph. I do not like graphing at all. I think it's one of the most tedious things to do in life. I, I think I took up biology so that I wouldn't have to do all of this. But unfortunately, we have to. Okay, so let's, let's get this graph once and for all in our head and let's never look at it again. Let's, just, let's not do this again. Let's understand it in the first place. A normal condition, Raj and Simran meet each other and voila, get married. That's it. 
registers. Normal. Okay. The rate of reaction goes up. Then the concentration of the love they have for each other gets saturated and they're like, oh, okay, we are not very lovey-dovey, but we're also not hating each other. So it becomes sort of finish and then it is following a stationary phase. Okay, so it's, it's going to just go like this. That's all. Okay, I'm going to write over here. What we see on this side is your rate of reaction. All right, this is your rate of reaction. And what we are counting is nothing but your substrate concentration, right? So here in the first go, what we see is the rate of reaction is just moving through and it's just going fine. Now let's introduce a competitive inhibitor here. When you have the competitive inhibitor, okay, look at how the concentration of your substrate seems to be manipulated. Because it is inhibiting maybe your enzyme or your substrate from meeting with each other, okay, the concentrations are not going high, uh, you know, higher or lower as they were in your normal sense. They are sort of being manipulated a little bit, okay. And then we come to your non-competitive inhibitor. It is basically slowing down your reaction. It is making it go a little askew. And there you look at the substrate concentration. Okay, so this is this is something that we have to be able to graph. Okay, and this is something that we have to be able to um, sort of note down in our notebooks. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just give me a second. Okay, so uh, what, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to read through a particular... Um, note that I have here with me, okay? And then I'm going to ask you if what I read actually made sense, okay? So enzymes can be regulated in ways that either promote or reduce their activity. There are many different kinds of molecules that inhibit or promote enzyme function and various mechanisms exist for doing so. In some cases of enzyme inhibition, for example, an inhibitor molecule is similar enough to a substrate that it can bind to the active site and simply block the substrate from binding. So here you have the enzyme and here you have the substrate. And then you have your competitive inhibitor, which is coming and competing with your substrate from binding with your enzyme. It is similar enough to your substrate that it does not allow your substrate to bind. Therefore, the concentration of your substrate remains higher. Okay. When this happens, the enzyme is inhibited through competitive inhibition because an inhibitor molecule competes with the substrate for active site binding. On the other hand, in non-competitive inhibitor, an inhibitor molecule binds to the enzyme in a location other than the allosteric site. What is allosteric site? Allosteric site is the site where you are going to have your um, enzyme and uh, substrate binding. Okay, so like, like your uh, enzyme is going to have, like your substrate is going to have a binding site or activation site. Your enzyme is said to have an allosteric site. Okay, so what it is going to do, it is going, the um, inhibitor molecule is going to go and bind the enzyme in any location other than the allosteric site, but still manages to block the binding of your enzyme. Okay, so now it's basically like you have a friend who's not really telling you not to do something, but is not even allowing you to do something. That would be your non-competitive inhibition. Okay, is that making sense? Are you following with that part? Pakka? Yeah. Yes, so this is, this is something that you need to understand. Okay, now there are going to be certain medications and certain kind of drugs, okay, that we are going to be, I hope not both of us, but humans in general are going to be consuming because we essentially want to achieve this um, non-competitive inhibition. Okay, just give me a second. All right, that was a good time. 
So when I say that you want to have this non-competitive inhibition, um, let's say that you have headache. Okay, you, you have like a lot of headache probably from listening to me for about an hour now. So you have like really, really bad headache. And what you are saying is, um, if only there was some way that I would not damage my nerves, but still also not feel so, um, you know, hurt in my brain. And there you go. There is a solution to that. You have a drug that comes in and binds to those sites on your neurons that are transmitting the signal, which is making your head hurt. Now, what they're doing is they're not stopping the signal from moving. The signal is still growing. Okay, the, your brain is still receiving the stimulus that, oh my God, my head is hurting. But you're not really able to um, do anything about it. Okay? Your brain does not know how to process that signal. That is what your painkillers do. They basically stop you from feeling the pain. The pain still exists, which is why when the effect of the drug wears off, you're back in pain. That is also what causes you to get addicted to these medicines because you like the way that it doesn't hurt, but then it also does hurt. Okay, That's like really complicated human psychology thing. But that, that is... About, yes? What about antidepressants? Do they work the same? Which, which drugs? I, I could not hear. Antidepressants. Antidepressants, yes. Uh, to a certain extent, they do work like that. Inside, you're still depressed. It's just that um, there are more happy hormones secreted in your body. So it's, it's basically like, tumare paas itna sadness tha, okay? And now what you're doing is, you're just giving some more happiness and compared to that happiness, that, that um, chemical high that you have, this seems like such a tiny amount. And so you're like, oh, this is so tiny. This is so short. Why was I even sad about that in the first place? Because now what you have is like a lot of happy hormone in you. Okay, so alcohol, marijuana, weed, they all do this. They make your problems seem a little smaller, probably because you can't fathom what is happening. So that's, that's what happens. Okay, so drugs basically work in this non-competitive manner where they're just they're just creating different problems for you. They're like, oh, what are you bothered about this small problem? Let's work together and make a bigger problem and be bothered about that. Like addiction or threat of dying or maybe actually dying. You know, headache seems such a small thing in front of those. That's what happens. Okay, so this is, this is something we are looking at now you are going to have different kinds of enzymes and there are going to be different um, you know, ways in which this enzyme is going to work. Now let me bring you back to your Michaelis Menten uh, part that I was talking about. Okay. Now whenever we speak about these two people, Michaelis and Menten, they basically used this entire understanding. Okay, now I hope you don't go over and be like, oh, I learned this amazing concept in biology today. Let me put it down in mathematical terms. But unfortunately, Michaelis and Menton thought exactly that. They were like, oh, my teacher taught me this amazing concept today. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to think of it in the terms of math. And so they made a model, okay, a mathematical model, which would uh, help us in understanding how the rate of reaction is in um, kind of influenced by the concentration of your enzyme or by the concentration of your substrate. They also said that no matter what, okay, now this is something that you are going to learn in your chemistry as well. Uh, this is this is another. Just, just a part of chemistry that you need to be thorough with, which is if there is a reaction that needs to take place, A and B, to form C and D. Okay, this is, this is a very general reaction that you are always going to study. The reactants react together to form products, right? It really doesn't matter in what manner and what pathway your uh, reactants take to make C and D as long as the concentration of C and D is remaining constant. The pathway is ill, uh, what, what is the word I'm looking for? Yeah, irrespective of the pathway you take, 
if the concentration of the products is remaining the same as that of your reactants, you have a successful reaction on your hand. Okay, so it is irrelevant what pathway was taken for this reaction to go ahead, whether you induced uh, catalysis here, whether you had your uh, catalyst participating, you did not have catalyst participating, maybe in the middle you heated up this product and you did whatever palana did gonna, as long as you got the product C and D, really doesn't matter how you got it, okay? So this is, this is a chemistry thing that we need to understand. And your Michaelis and Menton kind of seem to uh, be taking that into consideration when they made this equation. Okay, so now what does this equation look like? So it, it basically tells you that, okay, there is a certain concentration of your enzyme and there is a certain concentration of your substrate. And um, the relation that they have is that the rate of reaction is going to be directly proportional to the product of the concentrations of the reactant. Now seems like a very complicated thing, but it isn't. It basically tells you, I have this amount of A and this amount of B. Okay, this is what I have. When I mix these two together, what I get ultimately is going to be C. And I cannot, I just physically and logically cannot get anything more than what I put in, okay? So if I take one gram of sugar and one gram of coffee, and if I add five ml of milk and five ml of water, I cannot get 35 ml of pudding. That seems impossible. Like I did not even add the ingredients to do that. And look at the quantities of things I've added. How can 5 ml and 5 ml and 2 grams ever go on to make 35 ml of something? Makes no sense. Which means that the concentration of my products is directly proportional to whatever concentration of reactants I take. Is that making sense? Are you following that part? If yeah. I have a certain amount of product, it has to come from the quantity of reactants that I have used. This is literally what Michaelis and Minton wanted to say. And they could have said it just like this, but they were like, oh no, we're gonna use a very complicated mathematical derivation to say this, that if you take one gram of milk, or one gram of sugar and one gram of coffee, you're going to make um, toffee, which would be two grams. Let's not say it like that. Let's say it in a complicated manner. And that's exactly what they did. So when we meet for our next session, that is what we are going to discuss. Okay, so we are going to look at the derivation of Michaelis and Menton equation. Nowhere in exam would you have to write this equation down but you need to know how this equation came into being. Okay, you would need to remember the formula though. You, uh, you have to remember how to find out the rate of reaction, how to find out the concentration of your uh, substrates and enzymes. And once you do that, you're all set to learn about something which is called as KM. So I'm gonna leave you with this mystery as to what KM is. If you are very, very intrigued by what this could be, please go ahead and read your textbook and you would be a little more apprised when you come for the next session. If not, don't worry. I'm going to be telling you anyway what KM is. Okay, definitely not kilometers. KM is not kilometers here. So this is, this is what I'm going to leave you with for today. Okay, I'm going to be uh, sharing this recording with you. Yes. Does the M stand for molecule? No, it doesn't. So it doesn't stand for molecule. Uh, so we, we're going to uh, look into that. 
and i'll share the recording with you i will also share uh, the site from where i was reading that small paragraph i told you so it came from the site called as lumen learning okay l u m e n l e a r n i n g lumen learning this is a very good website to get your resources from so you could just go over there and you could read the information that they have i usually make my notes from there and um, well if you are interested you could go a little bit more ahead and you could find out what this game is you just have to put a topic and then just put lumen learning over that and they probably have the resources all the resources that you would ever need be it biology chemistry or even physics for that matter okay so this is it and i will see you for your next session and then we'll go ahead and understand the rest of the part right